Andy Harrison, Associate Fellow Rolls-Royce. Thank you very much indeed for talking to the AIM Practice video today. We're looking at industry and academia collaborations and partnerships. First of all, are these good partnerships to build up and what are the benefits of them? Uh, I think they are. Um, the benefit from my point of view is you get, you get a broader perspective when you're looking at a problem. So I kind of find half the benefit I get is, is information coming in from academia that I previously wasn't aware of. Um, the other side benefit you get is when you're trying to explain your problems to people and put it into kind of layman's language or the sort of the non-internal company language, it forces you to think about it an awful lot more. So quite often I find I end up solving half of my own problems simply by explaining it to somebody else and, and, and just clarifying it a bit better. So I think that's a fringe benefit we, we kind of miss quite a lot, really. Because you're externalising what you're doing and taking Absolutely. it to another community. Yes, you, you're having to kind of boil down the, the real detail into the essence of the problem, and all of a sudden, it, you know, the, uh, the routes to solutions suddenly can become an awful lot clearer to you, potentially. And what about academia? I mean, is it easy to just work with academics? Would I pick up the phone and say, I want to work with you, and you turn up at my university? Or, or is it the strength of the ideas? Um, no, it's not easy. Um, fundamentally, you have to recognise that there's uh, kind of a, a difference in mindset and motivations involved. Um, so there are some real sort of areas of uh, difficulty at the start of an engagement. Um, it's important to make sure that you've got a real understanding of uh, each other's motivations for getting involved in any kind of uh, collaborative activity or research. Um, so I've always found it particularly useful right at the start to be you know, completely upfront about my motivation for being involved. Um, and I guess in short, from an academic, uh, sort of a, an industrialist point of view, it's fundamentally about um, what am I going to be able to do and what value will I extract from the ideas and, and tools and, and information I'm going to get out of this collaboration. So. Um, I get no value out of um, the writing of academic papers, um, none from ideas. I only get any value back from research at the point where somebody in the organisation can essentially make a better decision or do a task in a more efficient or effective manner. So until I get to the point where the ideas have crossed the threshold of usability, um, it's, it's actually negative value. You know, I'm investing time and effort for no return. Well, might that make new collaborations tricky? You want to work with established partners because you know they can deliver. Uh, How, is it better to work with established partners or do they tire and do you need the excitement and energy of new? Uh, you need a mix of both, really. Um, you do need the ideas coming in. Um, clearly, it's easier to get into a, a more rapid delivery mode with, with people you understand and, and know. Um, but you can never guarantee you're working with the people who are the most knowledgeable on a particular subject. So we're always kind of looking around for, for new talent, um, uh, people with different ideas that, that, that challenge the norm. But underneath that, we do like to try and maintain a, uh, a kind of core capability. So um, we try not to work with uh, individual researchers dotted all over the country, we, we much prefer to kind of get a, a little group together so that they, they essentially can work and uh, learn from each other at the same time. So having a critical mass in, in a research field I think is quite key to, uh, to a successful collaboration. And can I ask who you work with? Uh, we do a lot of work with uh, the likes of uh, Cranfield and Durham, um, uh, Cambridge on occasion, uh, a variety of, uh, of other universities. So it depends what the topic field is. It tends to vary depending upon the particular subject. And how do you build up those collaborations? Do you go have a drink? Do you have a, a dinner? Um, do you sort of you know, attend their functions and network that way? Um, yes, on a personal level, I tend to um, initiate the, uh, uh, the kind of relationships. Um, 
normally by attending conferences or events that are, are organised, so you, you can get to, to go and see and listen to a few people. Um, quite often it comes the other way around, so I get invited to talk at uh, various uh, conferences and events, and you know that gives somebody a chance to to understand that they may have something of interest uh, to to you know the topic areas I work in the services field. Um, so is that when you perhaps get those successful ideas, you're mingling, you're talking, and you think that's a eureka moment? I'll take that back to yes. base and, and it will be successful. Um, is it that easy to spot a successful idea? No, it takes a little bit of nurturing. Uh, you know, the the first part is 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 really just making contact and understanding that that you have a shared space of interest. Um, so, you know, my interest fields are around designing for service, um, uh, service knowledge management, maintenance cost modelling, those sorts of things. So, I find that if I if I stand up and talk for half an hour on one of those topics. And a number of people, generally speaking, will come and go, oh, I've got something interesting you might be interested in. Um, you know, how does that fit with what you want to do? Sometimes it's things we've already got, um, and are well established in. Other times it's, um, you know, completely left field. And you think, oh, I should never even thought about that. Um, that's interesting. Not quite sure where that fits. But, and over time it sort of percolates in. You go back to it and say, well, I've thought a bit about that. Kind of seems to fit here in my um, my map of the world. So I find it's, it's a little while for your mental map to settle and uh, new ideas to, to mingle in, but you constantly be being challenged is, is good. And you seem to be saying they're very fruitful. Um, yes, sometimes they're very, very early in the, um, the kind of readiness to be used scale. So sometimes they're germs of ideas and they can take years to, to come to fruition. Um, either through the individual who suggested it or, you know, it just leads to uh, other networks and, and methods of getting to the same place. Other times you'll find a more um, developed idea that's out there. You know, something that you think, actually, that's almost ready for me to pick up. Um, you know, which is pretty much where we are with KT Box. A lot of the things that are being developed are ideas which have already reached a level of, of uh, maturity where you can see the tangible benefit and all you really need to do is take them over that finishing line to something you can use. So, uh, you know, I think it varies. Um, d definitely different starting points on the maturity journey um, which take different lengths of time to mature. Promise and expectations, you've just touched on that, but, but yeah. it, you know, do the expectations have to be tweaked adjusted as you go along? Can, do people always deliver on what they promise? Famously, you know, in entrepreneurship, you might have people who are good starters, but not good finishers. Uh, yes, you get all of that. Um, you have to be flexible. Um, I find that, I can't remember the last time I've ever finished something and it looked like what I thought it would when I started, um, particularly on these longer programs. So quite often, you'll set out with an idea of where you want to get to. And you know, I find it's easier to, to kind of visualize. Um, it's almost defining what does the destination look and feel like rather than how do I get there. I think that's the danger with a lot of these programs that we plan out a, a route march and head off down it and then uh, halfway along discover actually it's headed in an op opposite direction to where you thought you wanted to get to. So I like to try and describe who is the individual in the organisation whose life we're trying to make better, what is their current problem and what constitutes better in their terminology. If you can get to that point, um, so you've kind of, uh, you've identified not the deliverable of the programme um, but the outcome of the, of the activity, then it's easier to stay on route. Um, you almost develop the path as you go. The more you learn, um, you understand which way you are, are headed, you can then go back to your reference point of where was it you were trying to get to and, and just redirect yourself back in that direction. So the interests can be very, if you like, opposed. There can be conflict within those relationships, but there can also be revelations too, that, that actually by working through your differences... You, you yeah, know. I'm not sure I'd ever say um, as far as conflict... Um, there are not conflict. No, no, not always. I, I think 
No, in fact, not in my experience. I think there are differences of motivation. So it, you need to be clear about where all of the parties want to get to. So I want something that somebody in our organisation can use effectively to do a better job. Um, sometimes the academic parties want publications um, that they can put into journals um, to get recognition. Um, so providing at the outset you're absolutely clear about what both parties need out of the uh, collaboration, then you know, there's a degree of compromise you can get so that both parties get what, what they need. I think the difficulty arises where you don't recognise what either party needs or you know, both assume that actually their direction is, is the primary goal and uh, the other party is entirely secondary to the relationship. So I think providing you're clear up front, it, it's always worked for me. And what about revelations within those relationships? Perhaps is it about age? You know, people always say, you know, young people aren't risk, you know, risk averse when you get older. You're, you know, don't want to take as many risks. So, you know, basing risk against um, experience, is that a revelation or? No, not that I've, I've, I've seen really. Um, so do, do you think, well, gosh, I've never thought we could do that. I never thought we'd end up with this partner at, th at this point in time. You must have um, surprises. No, actually, I can't think of any so that, you, that you, have you, major ones. Of. Well, if we now look at public, private information sources, there's yep. been a lot of tensions in those, haven't they? How do you manage that because of the sensitivities of data? Do you tie it all down in IP? Do you structure it? Do you plan it out? Um, we try and separate the basic concepts um, from the detail that actually turns it into a useful tool. Um, so again, if you go back to the beginning of the process and you understand what the publication um, requirements are of the academic um, partner, um, it's easier to construct a, a, a view of how you're going to satisfy that and protect the IP. Um, so we, we would never publish our own data, um, for instance, as part of the academic research, but that doesn't always stop you being able to talk about the process by which you got to the answer. Um, and the concepts that are behind it and some of the underlying issues. So I've personally always felt that you, know, you have to satisfy the publication need in order for it to be a long-term and, and useful relationship. And therefore, you have to make a certain amount of compromise from the, uh, from the industrial side to support that. Um, but you can do that whilst protecting the, you know, the real competitive advantage. So it's not, you know, those tensions in the data sharing between public and private can be managed? They can be managed, but you must recognise them early. Um, it's not something that should come as a, as a surprise downstream. So I think the more you can get it, the, the motivations of both sides down on the table right at the start and be absolutely clear about it, the more you can manage that. Um, and it's almost better right at the beginning, if you can't agree on how you're going to do it, to, to just not, not take on the research. You know, and, and decide at that point that it's a relationship that will never work.